Rules of thumb are fundamentally important for every structural engineer. They help you check your designs, scheme up buildings, but also cross check other people's results as they're really the fundamental building blocks of what you should be aiming for. If you're too high or too low, you can either say whether your structure is too light or too heavy to make sure you're in the right range. And that's why they're fundamentally important. So these are the most important rules of thumb that I use on a regular basis to both check my designs and others. So let's break them down. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. When we're starting to scheme a building, estimating your beam depth is really important as they will reflect the depth of your structure and also the weight of your building. This I'll break down in two different aspects. First is the easiest version, which is the span to depth ratios. And these vary between RC and steel. So a beam will be somewhere between 10 to 15 for an RC structure. You can push that a little bit more with a post tension structure. So this is really where the starting point is and how far you can actually push it. With a steel structure, as they're a little bit stiffer, you can get a better span to depth ratio, somewhere between 20 to 25. There's other ways that I also look at looking at those beam depths. With a concrete structure, I'll look at K. What is K? K is M on BD squared. And typically for a beam, I want to try and be aiming for five for the most efficient design. Now, if you're in five, you're in a pretty sweet spot for a beam design. Now, if you want to really push it, for some reason you have something that's not really deflection governed, so it's slightly shorter, you might better push that up to 10, but anything above 10 to 15, potentially you're looking at an over congested beam that needs to be deeper. And if you are deflection governed, that's where you need to go back the other way. So instead of being five, sometimes you need to be three to get those same results. Now that's for RC structures. Now, if you're looking for a steel structure, this is really where I rework the formula. You know your deflection limits. And typically a steel structure is normally governed by deflection here. That's where reversing the formula to try and solve for I or for depth, for example. So you can rework the formula. If you know your deflection calculations, you can rework them. You know the deflection ratio for the loads that you're getting. You can work out the I that you need to achieve. Do a lookup table, find which I you're looking for or what size beam that would suit that circumstance. You do need to watch out for. It's fundamentally checking your natural frequencies as well for beams. Anything above four hertz is really what you should be aiming for. So just a quick rule of thumb that if you are getting bigger spans over eight meters, making sure you're also checking that natural frequency to make sure it's not too soft. As you will get this tip over point from shorter beams, which will be governed by strength, slightly longer beams that will be governed by deflection than anything over eight, nine, 10 meters, potentially you're not looking at deflection anymore. You're looking at a vibration controlled system. Similar to along the same lines as beams, slabs are also in the same aspect. However, they're typically not so much governed by strength, but they're governed by deflection. Because of their continuous and two-way nature, you can achieve better results. For a one-way system, typically you're looking at somewhere between span on 20. For a two-way system, because the load spreads around a little bit more, you can push up to about span on 30. And for a post-tension system, this is really where you get the biggest benefits. You can actually push it up to span on 40 or sometimes span on 50 if you're lucky. However, I would be trying to aim for the lower end of these brackets. And as typically as slabs are governed by deflection, your Ks need to be a lot lower as well. This is where you're looking for a K of three or less because they are deflection governed, not strength governed at this point. Columns is also another common thing that you need to size up. When you're looking at the building, they need to allocate space for those big columns to go through. There's a couple of rules of thumb that I work with when I'm looking at these columns. A really quick way is just somewhere between 0.4 F-C for highly stressed columns. This allows you to make the smaller size at the base of the structure. So you're looking at the strength grade that you're looking at the building. So whether that be 40, 50, 60, or 70, then you can just do 0.5 times that. That would be the stress range you need to aim for. So if you know the load rundown, you know the loads in that columns, you can quickly size up the different columns. On big, tall structures, you need to be a little bit careful as they will be governed by buckling, not so much by section capacity. Typically, it's a good way to start off with when you're allocating that space. But the biggest thing that you need to watch out for is making sure that you're estimating those loads. So how do you do that? Typically, it's about knowing the ranges of when you're doing that load rundown. So if you look at the column, you can work out what the tributary area on that column is. You know how many floors, but what load do you apply? You haven't designed the slabs, you haven't designed the floors, where should you be aiming for? Well, typically you're looking at most of the time a range for an ultimate load, somewhere between 10 to 15 kPa. Of course, on the higher end, you've got more storage. On the lower end, it's typically your residential structures. So looking at what's fundamentally on each floor. If you do have a floor for plant, maybe you wanna go for the 15. Then on the other floors, you go for the 10 as it's typically residential. And if you're in office space, you're somewhere in between. So say 12 and a half to 13. This allows you to quickly look at the number of floors, times it by the average tributary area and load that you want allowing you to estimate that load rundown very quickly. So if you're in the meeting, 
It's quickly taking in the scale ruler, looking at the distance between those columns, working at the temperature area on that column, times by the number of floors, then giving a quick estimate, maybe slightly on the higher end. Don't go 15, because most of the time it's not there. Don't go 10 unless it's all residential floors, but you'll get to a right size of a column very quickly. I allow you to progress that design further and give a better understanding to the architect how big that column needs to be. The one thing I also like to do is making sure you're sizing up the foundations as they need to know how much excavation they need. I've got a full math dot calculation that I'll also link in the below description that I've done in a previous video. But the quickest way to think about it is most of the time, depending on what you're on, if you're deeper down, you're potentially in a higher KPA soil. Higher up, especially in clays, you're in a lower KPA soil of say 100 KPA. If you're in rock, you're potentially even higher. So by looking at the more conservative way, so if you're up near the top level, 100 kPa, deeper down, maybe two to 300. If you're down on bedrock, maybe you can even get 500 or more. However, what do you use with that result? If you're trying to estimate the footing size, it's really quite simple. So you know roughly what the load rundown is from the calculation that we've done before. You can potentially work out what depth of foundation by giving the estimation of the bearing soil conditions. You can work out how much square area that you need to apply that load over. And you've got a point load in the middle, and typically you want it to be squared out you can work out half the distance and that's roughly the depth of your foundation. That gives you a really quick estimation of where you need to go. And of course, if you want to calculate a bit more, you can use the math dot spreadsheet that I've got linked here. And finally, for one of the most recommended ways that I like to look at drawings, it's not so much a rule of thumb, but definitely a guide, is looking for patterns in your design. Looking for patterns will make your life so much easier. And typically patterns are key to every single design. If you believe there is something missing from that pattern, why has that pattern changed? Is there some fundamentally different at this spot? Or is it the same? If you look for those patterns and try and explain why it's different, that will fundamentally find whether it's correct or not. If that pattern's broken, typically indicates that there's something mistake. So if you're saying a 200 beam, 200 beam, 300 beam, 200 beam, what happened? Did all the 200 beams need to be 300? Was that 200 beam oversized? Maybe it was just a bigger span or maybe it had a bigger load. But you need a fundamental explanation about why that pattern had changed. And that will allow you to quickly check a drawing and look at where you need to drill down in in a little bit more detail. I've linked all in the below description these different rules of thumb in different math dot sheets below. So I hope you check them out, try them out and duplicate them for your own use. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there are two ways that you can do this. And you can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. Keep learning and I hope to see you next week.